The way the Bible begins, we know is bullshit. Mm -hmm. The way the Bible ends, we mm -hmm. know is bullshit. Mm -hmm. See, you're left with this stuff in between. You have this burden on your back, and now it's 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 up to you to settle all these accounts. Wow. It's like, I didn't ask for this. I didn't, I'm not the person who went out and <laughs> trying to have your cake and eat it, too. You're trying to have a prophecy that works <laughs> for that generation, and as well, works for a future generation that lives by the same technical code as the past generation. So this is Ichapod. Been a minute since uh, the three horsemen were riding, but we're back galloping uh, <laughs> through the night. Uh, Jay Witt is there. Uh, not Jehovah's Witness, uh, but he's Jay Witt. Uh, he was in Jehovah's Witness Protection Program. <laughs> uh, snitching on his, his old boss, Yahweh. Still has not been uh, caught yet. If Yahweh catches up to him, who knows what will happen to him. But uh, he's, he's in hiding over there as a former Christian. Uh, then we got uh, Albert Kim and myself, Be Good, a.k.a. Brady Goodwin. So it uh, been a minute. I know you guys have probably missed us. But we've been living life, and we'll, we'll get into what that means maybe in a later episode. But yeah, living life. Uh, but tonight, we are going to dive into um, just some discussion of, how do I say this? Fellas, uh, did you know that Jesus is coming soon? Like, like any day now, like any, any minute any second, any hour, any year, any decade now, any century now, any millennia, like he's coming back immediately sometime in the future. Um, don't know how you prepare for something that, uh, that, is, that is always coming yet never coming. Um, but are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you excited? Do you feel, are you, are you, are you living on pins and needles? Um, or have you sort of been lulled to sleep? Um, you've stopped expecting. And of course we're all non-believers, former believers. So none of us are really expecting, uh, a return of a Jesus. But, um, I'm just curious when you were Christians, did you sense the imminence of his return? Did you pray, uh, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Um, or did you feel like it could happen in your lifetime? Did you feel like you could have missed it? Maybe it happened. Or like, what was your thoughts on the return of Jesus? We'll talk about how you looked at it before um, versus. I don't want to say how you look at it now, because I don't think any of us look for that, but how you look at those who look for that now. We'll talk about that in a minute, but. How did you look at the return of Jesus as a believer, Al? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a long history for me in some ways. Uh, long history in the fact that I think for much of my Christian life, I didn't preoccupy my mind too much hmm. about it. But when I ever I did, um, it seemed to be... Well, I, I remember being as young as maybe eight, nine years old, mm. and a Jehovah's, a Jehovah's Witness classmate would actually tell me about Jesus' mm. second coming. Wow. And this is, back, this is back when I was just more of a church, you know, like a kid going to church. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't too, you know, didn't know what to believe too much about this right. one way or the other. But that was the first time where I felt like, mm. like kind of like, kind of scared like am i mm. going to be ready for this wow thing? at eight years old wow me. yeah at eight years yeah eight years old when it was a jw huh. classmate so um and then i think when we got more kind of got a little older when i got into junior high high school then you start to think about hmm. and this is coming from a pre-millennial perspective so that's okay. that was kind of weirdly um so, you know, we knew about tribulations and all that. So, hmm. 
So and I think I, you know, you, you, for a time you get caught up in, in a little bit of the drama, hmm. of all, right? And it becomes this like, oh my God, like, is this going to, and, you know, what's going to happen? How's this going to pan out? And then you, you almost feel like it's like hmm. this. I don't know. It's like the way you speculate about like any other, hmm. you know, apocalyptic disaster, you know, th- th- you get caught up in that kind of, <laughs> there's a euphoria to that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. Some kind of weird. Yeah. It's weird. It's like, okay. you, it's like thinking about, I don't know. It's like thinking about sci-fi almost maybe in a mm. similar way where you get very enwrapped, like, no pun intended. <laughs> that whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But, you know, but when I got more serious about my faith in, mm-hmm. in my twenties as an adult, uh, then you start getting into the weeds, mm. and then I, you know, it's like a maze. I, I yeah. Just I didn't, you know, like the mm. you, you talk about like the problems of of trying to trying to bring out like the doctrines of the Trinity or the, the doctrines of mm-hmm. grace. But when you get into eschatology, it, yeah. it becomes yeah, it's like, like spaghetti mind game yeah. almost. It's, yeah. it's spaghetti, a total spaghetti. So, mm. um, and then I think, I think when mm. I met, when I was at good point. community church at John MacArthur's, I, you know, he's a diehard dispensational, right? Yes. And, um, we, I had a fellow, Bible study uh, person who was like he was like the eschatology guy Mm. just like diehard eschatology and he came to Grace Community Church just because of he agreed with the 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 eschatological views as well as the the Calvinist views of the the church but I think I think I kind of departed from my interest of eschatology at that point okay so he he you know because I just saw how entrenched he was mm. into it, and I realized I did not wow. have an interest. So you didn't like walk around with this sort of like looking at the sky every other day, like is it going to happen? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I didn't. I think I think I was a little more oriented towards reading the redemptive historical. Okay. Uh, like I like I I, I I I was more interested, I think, in looking back. Okay. Right? The whole. Ooh, a good point. Aspect of it. Got you looking yeah. back instead of looking forward. Yeah, L- looking forward. We're yeah. going to come back to so that in a minute because I want to sure. ask. It's almost easier. You know, you talk about the difficulty, the spaghetti nature of eschatology. Right. Looking forward is sort of like, I don't know what I'm looking at or looking for. Looking right. back, it's not much easier. Uh, I'm going to ask this question to you. And then right after you answer it, Jay Witt, I'd like you to pick up there and talk about how you saw things as a believer. Answer the same question. Al, did you think it was more likely that you would die and then see Jesus or that Jesus would come back in your lifetime? I think when I was when I was younger, adolescent, I think I would see Jesus in my lifetime. Okay. Yeah. As I grew older, I I less skeptical, Mm. more skeptical. Mm. Wow. Jay Witt? You know. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I think. I think as I got more mature in the faith and as a human being, I just realized there was something a little fantasy-esque hmm. about imagining that we who are alive, even the writer who says that, Paul, supposedly, mm-hmm. says that, you know, like almost as if as though you get to escape the one thing we know is as, as guaranteed as uh, taxes, <laughs> which hmm. is death. You know, so the idea being that, you know, through your religion, somehow you get to cash out before the huge stock market mm. crash and you don't mm. end up having to experience that. I think okay. I realized that was a little bit fantasy-esque, mm. you know. As a believer, you're thinking that. In, in the, yeah, I, I realized that when some, like the whole we who are alive thing, it was like, yeah, mm-hmm. Okay, we got about two thousand years behind of us of people who oh, or we okay. who are our lives. Mm. So one only has to just imagine. I don't know. If, if the was it almost? What, was any of it? <laughs> was any of it caught up in the idea of, um, like when you say that, you got me thinking. Is it what's so special about my generation that we're going to be the we who are alive? It might be a generation five hundred years yeah, from now. Exactly. All you have to do is just look back 
mm-hmm. younger years, and you'll see people writing as if it's though their generation. Right. So then you, right. you know, you don't have to be the greatest mathematician to think mm. that the odds are probably against mm. that happening in your lifetime. I um, got to make a note because so, we have to come back to that point. What am I going to write this note on? Yeah. Uh, I'm just, just going to write down, we who are alive. You've got to come back to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you know, it was really funny because I remember in junior high when I, I took a, our pastor did like a class crash course on cults, but like they, he would point out all the dates in which the Jehovah's Witness got it wrong mm. right, whenever they predicted. Mm-hmm. But it's mm-hmm. weird. They, we never, the implications of that are, are, are yeah. a lot more, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it involves them too or us too at that time. So uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, wow. what, is, what is the one thing most people don't want to do? If you if you could say most of all of humanity, no matter who you are, Republican, Democrat, if you're public person, speaking, if you're a person, what would you say? I said I said public, public speaking. speaking. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Yeah, but uh, yeah, second second to to public speaking is deaf, right? Right. <laughs> second, second to that is, is deaf. Hmm. But, you know, that's something that, you know, hmm. so is it surprising that religion, yeah. that a particular religion has baked into it an escape? Oh, wow. You know? even, wow. And they even... A... I'm, I'm sorry, you, you got me thinking. You're making me want to go here sooner now. Because, no, that's really, yeah. Yeah, you got me thinking, Jay Witt. Like, <laughs> be, a, lot of, a lot of the things you read in the New Testament about the end times the writers are having to write them because people are dying in the community. They're dying in the community. And supposedly there's this prophecy that Jesus is going to come back in their lifetime. And so that they're dying. They're like, yo, what's happening to the promise? So the writers are having to write things to ensure them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know some of us are dying, but we're not all going to die. This thing is going to happen while some of us are still alive. So what you're saying it's 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 so true that there's a motivation here to yeah. to assure someone that they're not going to have to die. And, and the flip side of it is uh, something I was thinking about as we were preparing for this. I was thinking about it. I think I was washing dishes and I was thinking, hmm. I was thinking of the utter lack of utility in getting into the nitty gritty of details with a first gener- a first century. Uh, you know, audience, the nitty gritty of, you know, things that are going to happen in the end times. I'm going to show you ahead of time. Like, there's a sense, I, I you know, I, I didn't quite put, I've never voiced this, but there's a sense in which it's like, it's not as if as though if you're giving prophecy, you couldn't just give it out to a, a generation where it would actually be relevant to them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if what I'm saying is making sense there. But there's mm. like, if you're telling me the details of what's going to happen when the man of sin is revealed or whatever is, you know, and you know, good and well, I'm 2000 years early. There's mm. a sense in which it has really no practical meaning to me at all. Like there's no real pra- practical application right. except now this is the thought except to keep me perennially in a state of, you know, be mm. also ready, you know, just like, mm. which like it could happen, it, it, even though it, it's probably not going to. It, even though it isn't going to happen, if I'm okay. in a posture of it could, yeah, could, it could happen any minute. I can stay mm-hmm. in a state of high alert. Some people have said that the war of terror was like that, where you just keep mm-hmm. people constantly in this. I mean, I think this is Orwellian. It's downright Orwellian, where you can kind of keep mm. people in this state of mind where they're thinking, okay, uh, wow, in a constant state of panic. Which, by the way, mm. is an impossibility. You can't keep. Just the human's psychological need for homeostasis, you can't be kept like that. That's why you have So hold on, because right now I've got, a, I've got a conversation going on on Facebook about Christianity and trauma. Can you, be, can you come out of the faith without trauma? And in that conversation, I actually said to someone, I think I was traumatized in the faith. And what you're saying right now, Jay Witt, you're talking about this idea of what does it do to your psychology, to your psychological state? to be constantly in this, you know, on pins and needles. I think about uh, if you lived through 9-11, I know even to this day sometimes I get stuck watching news and it all goes back to 9-11. Mm-hmm. 
that event was so traumatic, mm-hmm. it changed how we watch TV. They started putting, you know, that little ticker at the bottom where the words go across the screen because mm-hmm. even though it's important stuff, it's not as important as the big thing that's happening right now. So we're going to tell you this other news mm-hmm. down here, but we want you focused on this big thing that's happening. And I remember for years after, my TV was stuck on 9-11 because I wanted to feel safe and I knew that some, I'm not stuck on 9-11, stuck on news channels because I wanted to feel safe. Um, and it, you know, it just had me in this psychological yeah. state of, like you said, panic. Right. So just transfer mm-hmm. that to a faith, to a religion that's got you always on the lookout. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I just I don't need to tie <laughs> no, that no, in. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's important. Uh, it's, it's important that you were able to register that thought there, but I was leading actually in the opposite direction, which mm-hmm. I mean, was, that's totally valid too. I was just leading to the fact that, that you can't, it's because of the psychological need, it's a human need to, to find homeostasis and, mm-hmm. and, and we'll have future episodes that deal with this, no matter mm-hmm. how traumatic a thing is, is you can't stay in total despair. People say, um, mm. the pain is less as the days go by when you lose mm. a loved one. Um, and why is that? Even if you want to stay in a mournful state, it just, the the mind has this mechanism. It's autonomic and, mm. and, it, and you can't stay. So what do you do? Well, you get quotes like Martin Luther who says basically uh, if, if he knew it was all going to end, he would just plant an apple tree, <laughs> which is actually over against the thought of the, because according to, to what Peter and to Peter, the heavens are going to melt away with, with a fervent heat. You know, mm. there's like the whole universe is going to melt. And, mm. and this is a change of, but Martin Luther is telling you, well, if he knew this, the end was going to come. His first, his first impulse would be to plant an apple tree. And the idea is, well, sort of like, I'm not going to live my life. Like everything's going to melt away tomorrow. I'm actually going to get on with life like it's not going to happen. And I think until that, it does. in some sense, until it does. Mm-hmm. But in, in his mind, it was like, I guess he had a, a, an eschatology that said that God was going to basically restore the earth, uh, which that's another, probably an yeah. entirely other podcast because you have some streams of thought that are eschatological in the text that seem to to point toward this, this cosmological uh, disaster almost that will happen mm-hmm. at the end of days and then others that sound restorative but that's a I'm probably getting too so far I, ahead I, of myself I think I, I think though what I think what you're we're both pointing out here you guys are both pointing out there there is a we can make an analogy to I think the Cold War and the nuclear holocaust right mm. the potential for that to happen to some to some degree yeah but, I but see from it. like a behavioral standpoint I think I think I think the way what you're doing, Jay Wood, is you're trying to cast a general, general kind of a governing dynamic that happens with that. And I think Brady, what you mentioned about like what that does to an individual psyche is mm. more of like a beneficial side effect that happens to mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know any any kind of pathological religion or, or an ideology mm. that you know kind of pervades and captures like the imaginations of a lot of people at the same mm-hmm. time. So. Um, well, you but, say beneficial yeah, side effect, yeah. but I, I, beneficial how? No, no, no. only, 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 only to the institution. That, gotcha. That not, yeah. Not, yeah. 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 Only. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's a side yeah. effect, but it's in, but it's in the institution's benefit. If that's hmm. not necessarily, because I think, I think you're right, Jay Witten, to some sense, like we, we desire that homeostasis and how do you actually establish that somehow? And I think the biblical writer is probably, I, I mean, I don't know, the, However, the church may have done it or their church fathers may have done it, you know, post 70 AD. Right. And, mm. you know, that all of, I don't know, I, I'm not a scholar, but <laughs> but but I, 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 I really like this kind of analogy that we're pulling out here. This is really. Yeah. Well, something we'll have to talk yeah. about is one way to achieve a sense of homeostasis or at least just get you off that alert is to change the nature of what you're looking for to happen. Right. And we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. But. Um, so think about that, Jay, what you say, you can't remain on, in that, uh, pins and needle high alert state. It's not healthy to the human psyche. Um, but let's say you have a religion like Christianity that has this promise of something that's going to happen and it's imminent. Uh, but this imminent thing ends up taking 
at least so far, 2,000 years. Um, when it, when it, uh, what you know, does that do to the expectation level? And then what does it also do to the, to the fulfillment aspect? What must the fulfillment be like for that thing? Yeah, well, I, I was thinking of first taking us on a slight excursus. It's not, it's not totally, it's not, it's not unrelated, but it will help us to see this a little. And I was thinking one of my favorite movies to think through is Back to the Future. Okay. In part because Back to the Future, I believe, um, takes place sometimes in the 50s, a large portion of the first one, if I'm not mistaken. And the second one... It takes place it in takes the 80s, place... but he goes back to the 50s. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying a, the, a large measure of the action happens in the 50s. In right. The first one. But you're right. Like mm -hmm. I think for all of them, they're, they're kind of placed in like the 80s, but mm -hmm. they reference... The lion's share of the movie is actually in some other period, right? And so first, the first past, one, I think and it's then the eighties. This, and then the second one, they were looking toward the future, and I believe it was two thousand fifteen, if I'm not something mistaken, like that that they were looking. And so, and one of the interesting things is because we're in a period not too far. Actually, we're we're eight years past right what they Where were they trying were to predict, mm -hmm. and, and it's just very awesome because I think this is a good place to start. When you think about human potential, now <laughs> I'm getting ahead of there's so many thoughts rushing in my head, but you never want your prediction to be like you know it's going to be wrong if it's 2,000 years in the future. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you, right. you don't even have to begin, you don't even you have can't to connect to that think many of the dots. ways, yeah. Yeah, it's it's going to be it's going it's like how is it going to be wrong? It's going to be wrong in all of the ways, <laughs> like right. like literally every way it could be wrong. If it's two thousand years in the future, uh, are people going to have cars? No, they're not going to have cars. What are they going to have? They're going to have horses. <laughs> like, are they going to you know, like? Are they going to have airplanes? Airplanes aren't going to be around. They won't even have the slightest clue because mm. te technology, the advancement of technology, is based on other technologies. And mm. technology often develops by by way of discovery and invention, mm -hmm. and so it makes it utterly unpredictable. After you know, if, if I'm going to look out, if you say, "Hey, guys, what's going to be going on in a thousand? I haven't the slightest clue, right. <laughs> and I know whatever I'm going to tell you, no matter how. Um, I'm, I should let you interject. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I mean, I just I was just going to add. Not only is it based on that that power of discovery, it's also the it, it's one of its main features is displacement. So whatever new technology comes in, something else is going to be ruled out. The reason why we don't have yeah, pay yes. phones anymore. The reason why we don't have telephone books anymore. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now, now, just imagine. This, this is so awesome because just imagine you're in a context where you just can't imagine there not being a need for a pay phone. Right. <laughs> just like, <laughs> like, like, like the superhero Superman. He relies on a pay phone booth to to change his outfit. Right. Well. It's so written into the character, it kind of doesn't work if you have to get rid of the payphone. Right. Like, you guys can see where this is headed. Mm -hmm. I want to hear you a little on this, Al, because I can see you thinking. I know you got something going on there. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it makes me think of the fundamental first principles of, like, how innovation tends to happen with, mm. uh, you know, because certain sometimes uh, all it takes is one scientific discovery to jumpstart an innovation, mm. right? Where mm -hmm. you get engineers and everybody to kind of build on something, so... And just like if, if you if you went back in time and just told them you tried to explain to even like Archimedes right like you know tell him like you know explain to him what a Turing machine is what what it means for a Turing complete system to you know mm -hmm. and, and the whole reason mm -hmm. is like he can't because mm -hmm. he doesn't he have he doesn't have the abstractions of uh, you know Boolean mm -hmm. logic or uh, the principles of you know digital technology using electronics and using gates and all that stuff so Mm -hmm. It's like, so once again, it's like they're, they're lacking, you can't make those predictions even when they're lacking the fundamental concepts mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. think about mm -hmm. all the concepts that we won't even have, like th that is out of our reach today that, right. you know, we'll have the intermediate years, steps so. between what we have now and what they'll have right. 2000 years. We don't even know those intermediate steps, let alone the thing yes, that they'll exactly. have in 2000 years based on those steps. Exactly. Now, now, now back, now back to back to the future. Um, one of mm -hmm. the great things I love about it now, this Back to the Future is a great movie, 
in a lot of ways. And it's great for this kind of study because they totally missed it. You, you know, when you think about the 80s and prior, they always thought there was this, they, you know, Terminator or whatever. There's there's the idea that robots are going to be the thing that we... Now, in some sense, we found something that... Because they couldn't think and we... Oh, gosh, this is so good. <laughs> the, the robots are, are anthropomorphic. They typically, like, you think of Johnny Five. Mm-hmm. It's like... This is this is the God talk. Like you, whenever you try to invent something, you can't get away from you, like anthropomorphizing it. You just mm. can't get away from it. So when you envision new technology that's going to be smart and stuff, you start envisioning it like computers are basically like robots without the need for like what do you need another thing that has to have limbs and so forth? Well, it, far better co- concept is the internet. But of course. People who are human beings couldn't think of that in the eighties. All they had in their head was was something like some anthropomorphic machine. They they had no idea of an interconnected web that kind of brought human beings together and aggregated mm-hmm. our knowledge. It just didn't. Just like it didn't occur to them that like how base the idea of a god is and how anthropomorphic it is. It just it just doesn't occur to people. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, that is a bit of an excursus. That's getting away from yeah, my I got you. point. But when when you think about like Back to the Future and the things that they focused on, hoverboards, flying cars, pizzas that start off small that can blow, but they totally missed the fact that everybody was going to have a cell phone. They mm. totally missed that a cell phone is a portable computer and that that would revolutionize uh, the, the knowledge, the speed with which knowledge is uh, transferred from one individual to another, and that that would ultimately transfer the way we did like nobody is buying anything yeah. on an app on a phone yeah. in in Back to the Future. Go well, ahead. think about the, even the Jetsons, right? The Jetsons, we say, well, they got this right, they got that right. Well, we don't have the flying cars that they thought we'd have, and we do have one of the most important things I thought about the Jetsons was the Visa phone, right? That they could call and see the person that they're talking to. But we skipped mm-hmm. that whole. We, we're not doing it on TVs like they were. We're doing it on our on our mm-hmm. phones. We started on our laptops and yeah, on our phones. They missed that, but they, they had some idea of what we might be able to do. But like you said, they missed one of the key technological aspects of the future. In the yeah. 80s and 90s, you had a Walkman, tape mm-hmm. player, and then a Discman CD player. Mm-hmm. It, it revolutionized the world when they started making cell phones, but it until, even when you had your cell phone, no one thought about, the Walkman or the Discman and the cell phone being in the same device. You were carrying around both. Mm-hmm, yeah. And then even when mm-hmm. Apple made the iPod, you were still carrying around both until someone mm-hmm. got it in their mind. Wait, got to carry around both of these things? No, right. we're going to put these two. The, like no one saw that until we saw that. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, exactly. and for the person who's watching, like, well, what does this have to do with the return of Jesus? What we're talking about here is the book of Revelation. Really, the things that you see in Revelation that are telling you, and I saw this, and I saw this, and I saw this. Well, in John the Revelator's day, it was like, wait, you saw what? Wow, and this is what it's going to be? We're 2,000 years out from that now. And so for him to be saying, here's what it's going to be looking like in the end, of course, they didn't think the end would be in 2,000 years. They thought it would be in their day. So the things that he was saying is almost like, yeah. oh, wow, that's pretty cool. 2,000 years no, later. Let's, after still, we... let's still man it. Yeah, go ahead. Let's still man it. Even if he, even if he thought it was going to be in 2,000 years. Like, yeah. it still doesn't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, no, I just, you're probably absolutely right. But mm. even if he thought it was going to be in 2,000 years, it's like it was pre-industrial revolution type like it's a pre-industrial revolution world that he's envisioning. Like the hmm. industrial revolution, which we're over a hundred years past at this point, and it seems like old news. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, I think of that that magazine that uh, the, the A. A. Allen magazine, where it was like miracles happening in black and white, and we're looking at it in 2023, thinking like saying it's in black and white is a way of saying it looks old <laughs> you know right. but at least in, in that time because the television was a relatively new thing that was like oh this is cutting edge technology well yeah this is tantamount to that you know what i mean mm. like 
the end of the world happens and they don't even have a railroad. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> he couldn't even envision right. trains, you know? Mm. Anyway. Well, I, you I do have those people that thunder, would say, yeah. you do have those people that take some of the this, this strange imagery in Revelation and say, he didn't have words to describe a helicopter. So he, he described it based on things that he would have been familiar with in his day. But what he was really seeing was our yeah. technology. That's, I mean, that's the, yeah. talking yeah. about still manning the position, someone could say, no, he did see the future. He just didn't know what to call those things. Yeah, well, whatever, whatever he says, people are, st- their main mode of fast transportation is horses. Throughout Revelation, <laughs> like, there is <Right>. no, <laughs> and, and we're not talking about horsepower like of the kind that we think of in terms of a car. It's right. literally horses. Um, yeah, and it's like everybody's riding a horse. Nobody is showing up with the you know with the drop top down. Right. <laughs> like, even the even the the beings that are in heaven that are coming to do damage on the earth, they're coming on horses. Like yeah, whatever the, the future, horsemen. whatever just, the future for John is. Heaven has the same technology they had in 100 AD. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is interesting, to say the least. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if I was like, hey, Brady, I'm pulling up to your house on a horse, you'd be like, get the F out of here. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, but for some reason, we just accept mm-hmm. that the world that's a future world, obviously, because the end hasn't happened yet, is a world that where you're still... Where horses are a huge part of the conversation. Like yeah. if you go to Revelations nineteen, horses are a part of the conversation. Horses, swords, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, they don't even. Have, that's not even speak about guns. Right. Nobody has ammunition. Nobody's even <laughs> thought about that, right? <laughs> They're still fighting with swords. Um, <laughs> They're still having sword fights. How about this? They're bringing what knives if, to a gunfight, <laughs> right? Well, well, suppose somebody could say. What's going to happen between now and the end is there's going to be a nuclear war, maybe. We're going to destroy all our technology and we'll be back to horses and swords. And therefore, what John the Revelator saw can <laughs> still be future. It's just the future after a man-made apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah, and then, then you, it brings you back to what I said more initially where I said, uh, I said why the hell are you telling us about it now? <laughs> like, just, why don't you just save that prophecy for the people who need it? You know, like, because we definitely don't inhabit that world right now. Right. You know, mm. yeah, you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. You're trying to have a prophecy that works <laughs> for that generation, and as well works for a future generation that lives by the same technical code as the past generation. Like, how do you make that happen? Yeah, and just apply Occam's apply Occam's razor. What's more likely that we're gonna somehow do the 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 ill reverse technologically <laughs> or that or that is a dude writing about the future because he doesn't know what's going to happen. So so Christian think about that's that like, what's happening in Revelation is 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 he writing about a future that's going to revert back to living like the past so that it all makes sense or as Jay would said is this someone writing about something that was never going to happen because it was time locked and that time is past that's something yeah. you got you kind of have to you yeah. have to work through that there. I, I forget which skeptic it was that said, what's more likely that a person lied or that a miracle happened? Um, hmm. And, it, and I, I just, it applies here because, you know, you, all you have to do is just think about it. People lie all the time. It's, it's easy mm-hmm. to explain lies. They, they come from dishonest people. But the right. idea that, uh, you know, something very like, Preternatural or miraculous happen, like you know, for, think of Joshua with the sun standing still. What's more likely that the sun actually stood still, hmm. or that some writer didn't actually understand how our solar system works? Hmm. What's what's more likely? Yeah. What's more likely that a person yeah. like you know would have written that and not actually understood the implications of that because they didn't know how the sun and the earth works, uh, or that and, the sun actually and did not only still. not understood that but thought that their current understanding of it was as far as they were going to get. So there was no need to even think, Mm -hmm. I may have to word this in a way that a future generation won't have trouble with. You're you're not thinking about that. You think what you know is all there is to know. And so you can write this and a hundred years from now, they won't won't be any any wiser. And I think it's, 
this brings us back to the whole back to the future thing. It's it's very hard. It's a, it's exceedingly difficult to live in an era where you feel like you're advanced. You got to remember the New Testament. This is the, the the world of Rome where they had plumbing. They had you know, I mean they had lead pipes in their plumbing. So we know a little more than they did about health in that regard. But they actually had plumbing. You know they had public bath houses. I mean, in their eyes, they were advanced. You know, they were yeah. they were creating domes yeah. that after the fall of the, of the Roman Empire, they didn't realize how to build these hmm. architectural wonders until many hundreds of years later after the fall of Rome. And this is why hmm. uh, you had Gothic architecture where you had all of these buttresses because they couldn't really make a freestanding dome the hmm. way the Romans did. So they... they the Romans and people who inhabited that world thought it was a very technologically advanced world. And right. they didn't imagine. I mean, they weren't thinking about President Biden or people <laughs> rolling up with Humvees or whatever. Right. They, what they were thinking about were horses. When you thought about the how you got efficiently around on a battlefield, you weren't thinking about cars or helicopters or planes. You were thinking about horses. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, I, I can see your, your wheels turning right now, Brady. Uh, yeah, well, I guess what you're saying is someone in the past can write something and think, if this is impressive to my generation, this will be impressive to any generation. Or maybe they're not thinking about a future generation. Maybe they're just thinking, this will be impressive to my generation. We haven't seen this before. So I can say these outlandish things and blow people's mind. Mm -hmm. But the more time passes, the more those outlandish things become not so much outlandish as much as they are outdated. And it doesn't hit the same anymore. Hmm. Well, yeah. so the thing is, what's interesting is it lasts at least a thousand years, hmm. right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't until the medieval times where they invented trebuchets hmm. and cannons, right? And mm -hmm. so I wonder if like the theologians, if that kind of rocked their minds yeah. about, you know, you know, because it more or less, yeah, that we were using horses, we were using yeah. <laughs> swords and, and guns didn't arrive till, you know, the, you know, the millennia afterwards. So... Um, that kind of gives a little perspective on this. Right? So we're we're living off we're living off of the awe of a past generation, and at right. first it's like oh, right. But then the more time passes, it's like oh, <laughs> that's that's what you guys oh, thought, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, but we're it's kind of cute, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trying to think yeah. of some modern yeah. examples you know, I, of of that, like taking too long to come through with something. Dan Carlin, the podcaster. He talks about how um, I believe it was the first World War was was really when things started changing. And, so, um, and I guess this is we're talking about warfare. Well, that's that's heavy in the book of Revelation. Hmm. Revelation 19, they talk about yeah, right. uh, horses and uh, the flesh of the horses being eaten and stuff. Well, up until the first World War, horses and this old style of fighting, even guys with swords, mm. you know, it was almost like a meeting of the old world with the new world. The, the, yeah. the, the era when you had a person with a sword on a, on a horse, mm. but you also had a tank and they quickly realized, okay, that old mode is no longer, yeah. it became obsolete very fast when they yeah. started seeing right. the carnage of that from, mm. uh, that was resultant from the technology meeting this old school warfare, mm. you know? I'm sorry, Albert. You, you're saying something? Oh uh, yeah, no, was, you're right. I, I uh, I'm reminded of uh, when Dan Carlin described the Battle of Liege. It was the first uh, battle of World War One, and uh, because they were all forming up in the traditional way, you would you know move your uh, men to the front. Uh, the other side had machine guns <laughs> that mm -hmm. piled. The bodies just kept piling mm -hmm. up so piling. high. Yeah. They just mm -hmm. kept piling that, that they couldn't, they actually had a hard time hitting live targets because of how, yeah. how many dead bodies there wow. were standing in the way. So, yeah, there's there's an apt way. analogy. There's an apt analogy here for yeah. like, for the Bible and all of this religious nonsense. Like that's, yeah. 
that's of the order of the horsemen with the sword and like the world we live in now and our knowledge of tech uh, you know science etc is the machine machine gun it's, it's the machine gun just gunning down the nonsense <laughs> of these religious texts. well well think about <laughs> what's know? what's one of the most powerful verses in the bible when it comes to the uh, what what order uh, uh god's going to bring in in this in this new age it's They'll, you know, um, they will study war no more, right? In this new age, they're going to beat mm-hmm. their swords into plowshares, like plowshares. Yeah, <laughs> you know, their their weapons of destruction that they're <laughs> are using the swords. <laughs> are swords, and yeah. and the the sign of God's victory is there's going to be peace because they're going to turn their swords into things to plow. First of all, you don't plow with plowsheds anymore. let alone fight wars with swords i didn't even think of that yeah you know what i mean so like the whole (laughs) idea now you could say oh it's a metaphor or it's you know symbolic but the idea is right someone's writing in the past about a future that's it's not going to be like their like their present was but they can't they can't see that from their perspective yeah yeah again oh we have to pause and ask the listener what's more likely That they're just some exceedingly poetic individual, blessed Mm. soul, or that they actually are describing the world as they knew it and imagining the world being that way in the future. Um, So we we just just came to the title of this episode, Jesus is coming back, dot, 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 to the future. (laughs) <laughs> yes, 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 it's, it's yeah. not going to be the same as, as yes, they yeah. thought. You, you, you can turn, you can turn any person that's ignorant of the future into a poet by letting them just describe the future mm. using their current language. Right. Just say, call it a you, you uh, literary look back device. Say, oh, how poetic. Yes, yeah. how poetic. Yeah. How poetic. Of course it's going to sound poetic if you look at it that way. Right. I mean, it's he just didn't know what was going to happen in the future. But yeah. speaking of poets and the future, you said we had some musical examples to get to that kind of draw this out. Can you can you think of any? I'm, I'm going to think of some while you uh, talk about the ones that come you, to your you, I'd like I'd like you to head it off, if you don't oh, mind. This was supposed to be your piece. <laughs> no, I want you. I want you to add it off. I want you to I'm going to steal off. your thunder if you let me. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I feel free. Okay. Feel free, 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 free. All right. So one of the musical examples, you know, you brought this idea to my mind by talking about people like Dr. Dre back in the, you know, was it late '99s when he had the Chronic, uh, or was it early 2000s? Mm-hmm. The Chronic um, came out and mm-hmm. blew everybody it was, away. It was, it was. It was. No, it came out in the early. It came out in the early 90s, 92, if I'm not mistaken. The Chronic, was that old? 92, wow. Uh, came out with uh, The Chronic, yeah. right? And uh, blew everybody away because Dre was not really a rapper rapper. Dre was a producer. But he had some, I guess, some folks behind mm-hmm. the scenes, DOC and others writing for him. But the tracks, the whole album was just fire. And mm-hmm. for a decade, it was like, yo, this thing lived. And then word began to surface, yo, Dre's working on the Chronic too, and the anticipation, the the I mean the fever pitch it rose to in terms of cannot wait for this masterpiece to come out, mm-hmm. and we waited, <laughs> and we waited, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and to the point where we just began to say, wait, is this thing, is this thing coming out? Yeah, um, yeah. But I would like you to chime in because you, you you got you got me thinking about what does it mean for an artist to get the the culture so looking forward to so anticipating this project that it almost gets to a point where people want it so much and they want so much from it that it almost is a like it it lives in legend now the anticipation of it is almost mm. better than the thing itself. Mm. Because the thing could never match whatever you were going to create. Yeah. Uh, for several reasons, mm-hmm. it can no longer, it can no longer deliver. Either because, like we said about technology, either time has passed you by, and whatever you're mm-hmm. going to deliver is not going to suffice anymore, or the anticipation is built up so high that no matter what you deliver, it's mm-hmm. just not going to be the same because you waited too long. Yeah, and I, I think of. Uh... 
And, and you know, and hip hop is, uh, uh, according to Andre Three Thousand, it's a it's a young man's game. Mm. And so, you know, when you get a, a Dr. Dre who creates the Chronic, when he's very a, a very youthful Dr. Dre, when he's in his mid middle age, like expecting him to deliver this, <laughs> you know, cutting edge. Yeah. Hip hop album. <laughs> that's the sophomore <laughs> album to his first one. Is like you've. Th- there's an expiration date on those kinds of things. <laughs> like, mm. like you either you deliver it by a certain date, right. or it just it just can't. You know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen mm. after a certain. Um, so there are there are strategies that people use with certain things to try to keep. I mean, maybe we'll get around to that later. But there is a sense in which you. Especially when you couple, like, if we take this back to the text, if we're, we're using all of these uh, great analogies, but if we take it back to the text, for instance, and you make predictions, you know, we will be called up to meet him in the air and so forth. Well, you know, the Wright brothers kind of, you know, there was a time when that was a really big deal, you know. Um, now we have the technology not only to fly planes, but people can parachute, people <laughs> are. Was it the parasailing or whatever? Mm-hmm. And there's there's so many ways that human <laughs> beings can become airborne, either as mm. an individual or um, you know jumping out of a plane and landing mm. and being able to live and have that experience yeah. of flight. There, we've gone to the moon. Then. We've gone <laughs> to the moon. <laughs> some some of our brethren would would beg to differ, right? <laughs> <laughs> We got our if you believe this, if you believe the videos, we've gone to the moon, right? Exactly. Uh, India, yeah, yes. I think it was, just went to the moon, right, for the first time. Mm-hmm. Like, like being yeah. caught up in the air for them. Like, think about how did Jesus exit the planet, according to Acts, right? Uh, he was lifted up from their sight mm-hmm. and hidden by a cloud. We fly on planes mm-hmm. and look down on clouds now, so it's almost like, like you said, Jay Witt. Wow, um, when it was first written, oh wow. Now it's sort of like, oh, you know, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to come back in the air. Like, we, you know, we've got mm-hmm. frequent flyer miles. Um, now maybe they would say, no, but he's going to do it without, without the apparatus that we need. Like we can't just fly. He's going to do that without that apparatus. Maybe that still has some awe to it. There's a theme that comes out of this. And I think it's a, a theme that, I've seen flowing through all our pods mm. and one, and, and the theme is one of, yeah, I've given you this book and I've made these declarations. Now you have to keep it alive. Mm. Right. You know, like the, the, the reader has to make it make sense. Yeah. You know, and I, I remember thinking mm. when I left the faith about the relief that I didn't have to like, <sighs> try to like explain away evolution or whatever else, you know, or whatever scientific thing that didn't cohere with the text. Yeah. Because in a, re- in, there is a sense in which it's like a dead person leaving you all of their debt. <laughs> hmm. And it's like, you have this burden on your back and now it's, it's, it's up to you to settle all these accounts. Wow. It's like, I didn't ask for this. I didn't, I'm not the person who went out and bought. <laughs> like, I'm not the one, uh, to, to make reference back to our Rico case, I'm not the one who went to Sal's Pizzeria and ran up the bill eating a bunch of pies. But mm. now I got to take care of all, I've got to take care of the credit card bill. Now yeah. Because you're dead. You yeah. Know? Uh, and, and every and so, generation, every generation has to do this so that whatever the technological changes are, whatever the scientific discoveries are, each new mm-hmm. Christian generation will be responsible for explaining away how those things don't undermine or or destroy the faith. And like mm-hmm. you said, that's a huge burden. And I too, I I, I can remember the release, the relief mm-hmm. that came with. So I don't have to. Uh, you talk about uh, carrying around a dead man's debt. I can relate to that idea of. I don't have to come up with reasons to still believe this anymore, to justify this anymore. But one mm-hmm. of the things I no longer had to justify is he's coming back. Um, yeah. We, I had one more musical analogy that I thought was perfect. Jay Electronica, for those who know Jay Electronica, um, in 2009, he came out with the song Exhibit C. And everybody, mm-hmm. including Jay-Z, Jay-Z took his uh, 5% Nation of Gods and Earth chain off and put it around Jay Electronica like yo this dude is next 
he's going to save hip hop. And then Jay Electronica disappeared for 10 years. And everybody mm-hmm. was like, yo, where's this? Like, what, what happened to Jay Electronica? He would pop up on Instagram every once in a while and say something and then disappear again. Make a baby with Erica Badu and then disappear. Yeah. But he was not in the culture. It wasn't until, I think it was what, 2021, 2022, uh, when Jay Electronica finally, after all that time, delivered an album. And he was so gun shy that Jay-Z was on half the album trying to help him finish it because Jay Electronica, he's such a perfectionist that he never finished the song. They said they would wait two or three weeks for him to just write two bars. Now they said, He's such a great writer that once he wrote those two bars, you would be mad at him for weeks. Like, yo, it's just two bars, man. But he's such a great writer that when he wrote those two bars, you were like, yo, it was worth it. But after 10 years of waiting for him to materialize and quote unquote save hip hop, the album came out and no one even cared anymore. Like, sorry, mm-hmm. as, as good a mm-hmm. rapper and writer as you are, you even got Jay-Z on the album. But... That was 10 years ago. We've moved on. Mm-hmm. And I wonder yeah. <laughs> to yeah. what degree, like each generation, you know, as you yawn and you look to the sky and you, like at what point does Jesus come back with something? And <laughs> like, what is he going to come back with that's going to make the nations say, this is what we've been waiting for? Or will it be like Jay Electronica, mm-hmm. like, Man, you could have bought this back in 200 AD. We would have been like jumping for joy, but now it's just kind of like, oh, <laughs> thanks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you you bought horses with you? Mm-hmm. Cool, thanks. You, you got a yeah. sword coming from your mouth? Cool, like okay. Yeah. Uh, next, I got, I got the Glock, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, but it's, it, 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 there is a sense in which I know the some listeners are saying, "Look, see, these are the scoffers that were predicted." Yeah, and, yeah. and mind you, the that prediction applied to scoffers during their their lifetime too, during the first century, mm. uh, when or or even later, whenever that was written, and it was a response to the cynicism that sets in when people are like, "All right, you," I, I mean, like you did it. I didn't make the big promises. <laughs> right. Like, if you make big promises and then they don't mm. get delivered on for for two thousand years, do you expect people to not scoff at the certain certain ideas? I mean, yeah. okay, so let's take a look at that. There's the idea that it's unreasonable to look at claims that were made two thousand years ago, mind you, that's a very long time, and say, hey, you know, okay, the technology's kind of surpassed whatever is talked about in these promises, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe it's kind of not looking like it's going to happen. Right. And, and, and for you to look at me and, and apply a passage that was written to people who were already doing that maybe 200 years after. Right. right. <laughs> and, say, and say, look, see, they are, they predicted you a couple. Well, you, well, you're damn straight they predicted because mm. they were already complaining about it two or 300 years after it was made. The promise mm. is made. You see what I mean? So it's yeah. there's a sense in which the, the scoffing is merited hmm. you know it's like it's like um i i, I think of uh i think it was christopher hitchens when um he he, get, he used to get very annoyed when people said oh that's offensive as if as though that's an argument it's like <laughs> you're supposed to be offended you hmm. know what i mean if you hmm. believe this nonsense and i challenge it this is i'm i'm offending you on purpose yeah. if Yes, I'm scoffing. Yes, I'm scoffing at ridiculous ideas. Scoffing is is, is an appropriate response to the nonsense. So, uh, Vocab Malone, uh, Vocab Malone is the Christian uh, apologist who uh, organized the gaggle of people that uh, made those video reviews of my book, Let There Be Gaslight. Just a few days ago, Vocab Malone took a clip of a video of mine and posted it on Instagram and did a poll to see if people agreed. The clip was me saying, yes, I admit, I I mock Christianity. But I feel like if there is a real, if there really is a God, that that God probably laughs at my jokes. Like, he's right. (laughs) So Vocab Malone made this poll. He played that clip and then he asked, does God laugh at Brady's jokes? And so what you're saying, Jay Witt, um, uh, you're you're smiling already. I want to hear your response. But to what Jay Witt is saying, like, the ridicule or the laughter or the mocking 
to the Christian that says we shouldn't be doing that, you really got to ask yourself, even Paul said, yo, if there was no resurrection, we're to be pitied above all men. Like, if this thing is not real, and if this is not really going to happen, if there were prophecies that were made, if Jesus told people, some of you who are standing here are not going to die until you see these things, and that doesn't happen, and 2,000 years go by, how long do you want us to respectfully just keep, you know, bite our tongues and just and keep saying it's going to happen anytime soon? At what point do we get to say, ah, uh, come on, man, that's not going to like when? And if you're yeah. telling me that there's a God who's angry at those of us who say this is not going to happen, like this is this can't be true, and He's angry. Um, what is he angry about? Like, what have we said that's that's not uh, warranted? Well, I mean, also, I mean, we had the promise of Revelation 22 where, you know, Christ is said to say, I, he would say something like, behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, that happens to rhyme, but it's also absurd. It's not true. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, whatever quickly means, that's, right. it's not you know, it can't mean two thousand years. Well, I come quickly. If if your idea of quickly encompasses a two thousand year wait, then I don't know what. Quick well, you already means know anymore. that people who are going to say to you with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one yeah, day. Well, so, I mean, yeah. Jay Witt, it's only been two days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but here, here, you, you you can't be you can't be the person debunking relativism and then do that with time, hmm. like. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Many people who will make that argument will su- simultaneously try to debunk relativism. And what that that statement does is relativizes time. It makes it something that has no real meaning. Like, yeah. what's the point in saying I'm coming quickly if quickly doesn't mean quickly? What's yeah, the point? I, 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 well, also, the, the bigger problem is is the, the analogia fide is a terrible interpretive model, hmm. basically. So you can't even use... <laughs> your, you know what I mean? These people, like, they'll they'll... That, that, that you you have to really undercut a lot of the assumptions and how they, you know, uh, use the text, the yeah. methods of interpretation, as well as, you know, understanding. Like when, when we talked about the spaghetti, right, of, of mm. es- eschatology and all that stuff. It's it, you know, and then you get into the debates of of you know where it kind of leads you to, uh, yeah, I, you know, like for me, like I, I you know, I'd entertain preterism, you know, at, like after I left the faith, right. Um, really? And I, I remember, I re- what was that? I said, really? When you say you entertained preterism after you left the yeah, faith? Pre- yeah, yeah, yeah. O- only because now, like, when you're when I was no longer Christian, then then now you're kind of revisiting okay. uh, uh, what your interpretive methods and processes okay, were. Okay, so not right? entertained then, it like maybe that could be the truth. Just entertained it in terms of what, what, what was that argument about? Yeah, what was that argument, and then and then like seeing validity in some of the argumentation there. But okay, I, I'm well, not well, a preterist. Well, but no. But for the person who's saying what is preterism, like what what is a preterist? Won't you explain as you get into the point that you were going to make? What is a preterist? What does that mean? So 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 my understanding of preterism is that uh, when Jesus and Revelation makes the prophetic uh, predictions about his second coming and all of the heavens and the earth, etc. Uh, full preterism more or less says it all happened at 70 AD because it's uh, the entire context is is central to the state of Israel and God's relationship and his covenant with his people. Mm. So uh, I see the logic of that, right? But obviously there is the interpretive problem of now you have to spiritualize other things, Mm. right? In in, in other parts of the Bible, then it becomes this entire like... You're weighing literalism with right. uh, spiritualism. With, and you don't uh, really have a real guide in terms of why you're it, taking this literal, but that figurative or spiritual. Yeah, well, I got to interject. Oh, 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 I got to interject. Go I have to interject there and say that the, the guide is, well, if it doesn't work, then it has to be spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. But, but, but I, I, think, I think all three of us agree with the preterists when, when Jesus says that this generation will not pass. Like, mm-hmm. it literally means this generation. Right, that so that's, that's of, uh, Mark yes. 13 is one of the passages where Jesus says, he, right. you know, they ask him, they ask him, uh, teacher, tell us when will these things be? 
because they're, they're, they're going right. out and they see the, uh, the temple. They say, uh, teacher, look at these great stones of the temple. Jesus says, ah, you think that's so great? This temple is going to be thrown down and not one stone will be, will be standing upon the other. They say, when will these things be? Then he gives this whole list of things that are going to happen in Mark 13. Uh, when you see this, and when you see this, and when you see this, and when you see this. All of the discourse. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. then one of the things you're going to see is him returning in the clouds with the angels and the, the power and all that. And then he says to the people that ask him, tell us, when will these things be? When will we see these things? To them, he says, I tell you that this generation will not pass away until you see these, all these things I just said, these things. Uh, and so the preterist has to say, either, if the preterists are not right, the way some people get around it is they say, oh, he didn't mean that current generation. He meant the generation that sees all those things. Okay. That generation won't mm. pass away mm. Right? Mm. until they see mm. those things. <laughs> mm. Mm. Or the preterist is right, meaning, well, then Jesus can't be wrong. So that must have happened when those stones of the temple were torn down, which was 70 A.D., so if Jesus can't lie and can't be wrong, he said the generation was not going to pass away before 70 AD and he would return, mm -hmm. then he must have returned in 70 AD. Did we miss it? Yeah. No, it just happened in a way that we don't often credit it for happening. He returned that, That's another problem with the, the... I pointed it out earlier, but mm. it's worth noting here another problem you keep running into are these useless prophecies that are given mm. to people. So like you have, you know, if you want to interpret that as being, Oh, Jesus was saying that even though there was not literally a scribe sitting down writing, he's like, this is not going to, until this, you know, th this generation and the scribe is like writing in a footnote. Well, that is the generation that will have seen these things. Right up. It's like, I mean, like, like people don't talk this way. They don't talk to future generations right. in that kind of a way, you know? Uh, so, and even if you want to say he did, there's a certain kind of uselessness of certain information for the yeah. current. It's like me. Because they asked him, him, tell us when will these, when will we see yeah, these yeah. things? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, of, I think of that. I think of that, uh, part of Jay-Z's rhyme where he's like, I'm not looking at you. I'm looking past you. And, <laughs> right. and, and, and I think it's almost like Jesus isn't talking to them. He's talking past them. Through them. Yeah. Us. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking yeah. through you. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 He's like, he, he has some sort of future generation in mind. And so does the writer of revelation or whatever. Well, that's a point I wanted to get Bible. back to right earlier. You, you brought this up. We who are alive, Remember, we talked about that. Not, all, not, not everyone's going to die. Um, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive. As a Christian, I'm curious, Al, and then Jay Witt, I'd love for you to answer this. When you read those passages, did you think that that ancient author was talking to your generation when he said, we who are alive? Did you skip over his immediate audience and apply it to you or maybe even a future generation? Or did you think at all, ever, as a Christian, did you think, hey, it sounds like he's talking to people then. And if that's the case, this is this is not right. When I when I became mm. a millennial, I kind of reserved judgment, I think, for that completely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think Explain that for the people. If you like, I know you got to think back it, to it, your it's days. Weird. It, it, it's weird because when I when I when I when I became more a millennial as a Presbyterian, I so it, break that I down. What is was... that? What does that mean? I'm a millennial. <laughs> so a millennialism is. Uh, I know you got to think back to the days when you thought about this. Yeah, story. I have to think back to the days, but it it it, it more more or less is a partial preterist viewpoint. Not always, but it, I don't want to get into the complexities of mm -hmm. that. But but that some of the things in which Jesus describes in the Olivet Discourse uh, did happen by mm -hmm. the, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So therefore, the new, the new millennium or the kingdom itself was the church age, right? The church age that we're living in. That we're living in. In other in words, so, not to cut you off, but I want to make it clear. Yeah. 
the way that I always thought of and was and even was taught our millennialism right. is that the kingdom is now. Kingdom this the right. thousand year reign of Christ is not some future thing that's going to happen when he returns. Right. He already returned. His kingdom reign is now. now. And mm-hmm. even if it's lasting longer than a thousand years, thousand just means a long period of time. Mm-hmm. His kingdom is now. That's our millennialism. And so you're and saying when you were a millennialist, go ahead. When I was a millennialist, I like, so I embraced covenant theology more or less. Uh, you know, I, I kind of understood that to be the architectural structure of the, of the biblical data. But I think in some ways it was me for to, to kind of hang my coat on the whole es- mm. eschatological conversation because I was like, I'll just accept that and I'm just going to move on. My, like, I just, I, I don't care. Like, I, I just, I didn't really care anymore. Yeah. Because I, mm. it just, the whole thing, it, it's a, it's a completely con, like the convolution mm. is, oh my goodness. Like, talk about like, you know, mm. something like, is it even worth your time anymore to gotcha. think about that? So hold on. So I'm not sure what that means. You thought about this passage though. Like when you see the, we who are alive will be caught up with him. How did you take that? I mean, I, if if I'm if I'm not mistaken, like I'm trying to remember here, but I think I think one way that R.C. Sproul interpreted that was, um, he he was making reference to like the, the what is it the Roman way of like invading a country or something, mm-hmm. or a, so what they would do is they would they would I, I don't I, I forgot really. yeah. I, I I don't remember, but I but. I remember hearing his his example, and I was just like, it just sounded speculative to me. Okay. I, I, I was just so I just I reserved judgment. I think gotcha. at, at some point, okay. I was just yeah. like, I, I don't. I got gotcha. you. I don't know, man. Okay. It's like what the hell? What, what, <laughs> like like how 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 do you expect anyone to mm. be? You know, it's just like being on this side of the faith. It's just so ridiculous. Like mm. how how can you be dogmatic about any of this? Yeah. Stuff? I mean, it's just. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like it's like in it's like in Islam being required to learn Arabic or something to. Mm. Like each generation has to like hip themselves up with the hip themselves to the context that something was written in and then have all of this nuance. And, you know, mm, th- you right. have, I remember, uh, uh, I think it was Carson who referenced the shoe cobblers in, in Puritan, Puritanical America having the Greek New Testament text out while they were doing, you know, cobbling shoes and stuff. Mm. And it's like, yeah, I mean, this, this sounds I mean, this is total insanity. Like mm. for for us, that that's absolute insanity. But this is what it ends up requiring of you. Like yeah. that's it. Like we. Yeah. The question to you, Jay, what did you do with that? We who are alive. Did you say the writer wasn't talking to them? He was talking through them. Or did you think at any point, man, it seems like he's talking to them? And if so, hmm, something's off. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, obviously at the time, I didn't come to the conclusion that. Some of these texts were pseudepigrapha written later mm-hmm. purposefully for the purpose right. of being an apologetic mm-hmm. and for the purpose of being an encouragement too. So right. apologetics and encouragement go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. And I think I talked I talked previously about the self soothing nature of apologetics. Yeah. And you see mm-hmm. you see that sometimes they're joint and marrow <laughs> they're 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 almost uh, inseparable, like mm-hmm. joint and marrow, as, as the Bible speaks. You know, like th- that is the apologetic and the um, and, encouragement and to the, the believer. The, the encouragement to the believer. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it makes total sense now as being pseudepigrapha written later to be an encouragement to people who were seeing that this thing wasn't being fulfilled at the time. Uh, I would have probably seen it. You know, to to be honest, I think I noted it. If I'm being honest, but I'm not talking there. There isn't a believer listening to this that doesn't that hasn't engaged in some uh, intellectual. I would almost call it intellectual dishonesty if I'm being very, very frank. Mm. But I will say, you know, it's the it's it's the it's the skeletons in the closet. Hmm. And maybe that's an episode for for the future, yeah. too. I know for me, I, I recently cleaned out a closet that. I think the the whole skeleton in the, in the closet analogy came from the idea that people often took take a closet in their home, and when they don't when they have something, they're like, eh, um, kind of don't need this anymore. But 
I might want to save this computer box for when I move. Okay, I'm going to put it in the closet. <laughs> you know? No, some skeletons people, in the closet it, came from people that had something to hide. Like, you got a dead body, you hide I, it no, in the no, closet, no. and I, it turns into a skeleton. That's the... I, it's, it, it's not, I, I forgot about something that I just didn't I, use. I, I know that. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm pulling on the closet part of that, that mm. um, metaphor and saying that closets are a place that people put inconvenient things in sometimes. And I'm, I'm just taking it. I'm not trying to. I, now, I just, I, I like the, since you're using that phrase, I like the original connotation. It's not just inconvenient. It's in, it's incriminating. You put incriminating yes. things in the closet. Yes. Okay. So you can delete this from the thing. No, no, no. I mean, it, I like the <laughs> no, way no, the please, conversation please, went. No, no, no. no, no, no please, please. Okay. Because, because I, because yeah. for me, I obviously I understand what the way they use skeletons in the closet. Mm-hmm. It's like you know, you're basically hiding your dead body, obviously. But what I'm saying is, I'm talk, I'm drawing out the fact that closets are often places that people put things in their house that mm-hmm. they don't know what they're going to do with like it's almost like a place mm-hmm. it's 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 like a purgatory for indecisive type stuff mm-hmm. stuff that i haven't decided yeah okay is it trash is it something i'm going to use later right i put it in the closet close the door i don't actually have to see it and it's not taking up floor space yeah but uh and, and, and so just that piece of the analogy I, I was applying to there's a better analogy there's a net there's a better metaphor for what you're talking about you're talking about sweeping yeah, something yeah. under the rug sweeping something under the rug yeah that's, yeah. that's, that's another that's that's, that's a more like, fitting yeah. idea closets like i said i like the way that conversation went because i think for the christian who would want to say like it's almost like you're giving them a nice way out like that's all mm-hmm. i'm doing i'm just putting inconvenient things in this because we all have theological issues that we didn't want to think about too much so we swept it under the yeah. rug we didn't yeah uh, nah, swept, we got the, 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 that's 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 perfectly fitting that's apt yep. that's an apt uh, yeah, yeah. metaphor yeah. here so so what we'll say is sweeping it under the rug for instance yeah and you know it, after a while your rug is bulging quite a bit yeah if you if the longer you stay there you you find i think that would have been what happened to you in seminary. You found that your rug yeah. had to get larger. Big, big you had to get stink. a bigger yeah. rug. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it, it started off as a small prayer rug, and the next thing you know, it's this huge area rug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad we went the way we went, we went because I do think that verses like these are skeletons in the Christian closet. These are the things that true. if people true, true. find out about these and you're forced to look at them, it's yeah. like, I don't know. I don't want to look at that. And, and to be honest, well, I wouldn't say I was doing what you said, Jay, but in terms of being intellectually dishonest. Mm-hmm. When I read passages like, you know, we who are alive, for whatever mm-hmm. reason, I did not do. I didn't do the exegesis that I was taught. I didn't think who's writing and to whom. I immediately thought, this person's talking to my generation without doing any kind of trickery in my mind. And I think without, without thinking about it, here's what happened because it hadn't happened yet. He must be talking to a future generation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It didn't even dawn on me that if it hadn't happened yet, then the generation that he was talking to was being misled. That didn't even cross my Mm -hmm. mind. It didn't happen yet. Oh, this must mean this. We must be a future generation. Go ahead, Al. I saw you. Yeah. No. I. Uh, I can totally. That's a totally valid. I think you know. Despite, like, I, I wonder if, if if I were to go back in time and I mm. were to really press myself, maybe that might have, may have come out as well. Like, mm. you may have to just because it's just the. It just feels so abstract. It feels mm. so separated from reality I, I i you know i i remember it's like sometimes when i would see conversations of eschatology being discussed among non-christians somehow it's like that mm. made me kind of cringe because mm. i was just like there's no way this sounds any like <laughs> like the, there's no way this sounds like attractive to mm. a non-christian when you when you deal with the, the you know all of the the, the the difficulties in explaining and why there's so many views and and the fact that you have to justify just things that just sound so fantasy-like—it's mm. just yeah. so—it's clearly like that. So I, 
I, I think I had this unconscious, like repul hmm. repulsive kind of feeling to, to do ever doing that. So I, I remember, but, I, I remember sitting around with uh, brothers and uh, arguing post mill, I mill, right? You know, I remember those infralapsarianism, yeah. prelapsarianism, yeah. like all kinds of stuff, and um, and. Again, this it was the, the intellectual banter of it all was somewhat of a distraction from the absurdity right. of it all. Mm. You know, so like, if it's it's like, it's like mm. a board game that somebody has invented or something. Mm. If you accept the rules of the game, like there's wow. no reason to accept wow. the rules of yeah. of uh, Connect Four or whatever. But right. once you accept those <laughs> rules, right. right, now now we have something I can engage in intellectually. Mm. Like, um, I, you know it. Like you take the rules out of Monopoly and it's nothing. But once I accept those as being these, these are the rules. They're totally capricious. They're totally arbitrary. Yeah. There's no, you know, what's the basis? What's the metaphysical basis for your rules from Monopoly? You know, what's the transcendental argument? Like, all right, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, yeah all right. Are you happy? All right. So after you accept the rules mm. to that game, now you have something that a person can excel in intellectually, something that can stimulate a person in thought, something that can stimulate conversation. And this is why you have great intellectuals within the faith. I mean, mm. you have your John Owens, you have right. your Jonathan Edwards and stuff. You can and you can devote the same brain you could have mm. devoted to some great uh, field of physics or something to, to trying to argue for post-mill or on-mill. Like, it, yeah. it totally, that's how it works. Mm. That's how it works. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? This has implications for daily life because I just, I, I think about there's certain people, certain Christians in my life who, upon my deconversion, um, like their their efforts to, whether it be hold me accountable, whether it be to, you know, just check me on certain things. Like once I rejected the rules of the game, it like they lost all power. It, it They lost all inroads to be able to, like I'm not playing by those rules anymore. I don't, Mm -hmm. I could care less, um, mm -hmm. but because they still saw the rules as being in place, they thought that they might be able to still, uh, now I'm accountable to people as just a human being. Mm -hmm. If you're going to just play by just the rules of humanism, then sure, I accept those rules. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you're going to box me into your, your faith, I don't play by those rules at all. Like you're not going to hold, you're mm -hmm. not going to check me, uh, according to the rules of that book. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, whether it be excelling intellectually on the ground rules of the book or um, just daily life, uh, once mm -hmm. you reject those rules, you're you're playing by you're playing a whole different game at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This gets mm -hmm. into a lot of things that are, are that are happening in our day and age. Um, mm -hmm. Think about why so many um, far right wing Christians are so adamant about having a Supreme Court or a president mm -hmm. on their side. These are people mm -hmm. who are who are very much trying to make something out of these prophecies in mm -hmm. our lifetime, where they're trying to see these things live. And it's almost like um, for the faith to still have any teeth, mm -hmm. it's almost like a last ditch effort to see We're this thing come alive. Change. Say again? You have the, I say anti-climate change too. You know, like there, there, there are a lot of believers who are pretty anti-climate change, and which I, is I weird to me because I would think seeing the temperature rise and wildfires, I would think that would make people say, "Ah, this is God's judgment. This is the the book coming true." Like, so it's almost mm -hmm. like you almost caught between a rock and a hard place because you want to take this hard right wing conservative approach, but at the same well, time, I, I, honestly, honestly, I think, I think. I, this is this might be a slightly different take on it, but mm. I think some people are like literally to hell with the earth, <laughs> like mm. quite, quite literally to hell with it. You know, mm. like if this come quickly, Lord Jesus, and I'll help you. I'll help you do it by getting myself a, a huge sedan or something. Yeah. You know, like so maybe you know we can, I mean? like yeah, maybe we can end on this note. Well, go ahead, Al. Go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say that I I think also the yeah I, I didn't point this out earlier, but you know the the, the problems with these prophetic imagery and mm. descriptions are, are is in fact the general nature of them <laughs> mm. they're, they're not specific enough as to cause you know anyone to really 
you know, when Jesus says to look out for these things, it's mm. like, okay, you've just described things that <laughs> happen a lot almost yeah. every day. Yeah. It depends on where you are, who you are, and, mm. you know, uh, mm. but, but, then, but then there's no, like, there's nothing qual- quantitative about it. Like, there's no, there's got to be at least some quantitative measure. Well, so you know what's for, crazy about that, you know, Al? It's, you, you sort of paint yourself in the corner the second you try to use prophecy anyway, because... Right unless you're going to prophesy things that really are divine, once you start prophesying human things, you have the, you run the risk of creating self-fulfilling prophecies. Right. Because mm-hmm. how do you prophesy something and then have it fulfilled without people saying, oh, well, that's just somebody who read it and then did it. Right. Well, I mean, that's, 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 isn't that how the, the New Testament uses the Old Testament? Either? He Well, he went he did this so that he would <laughs> Right. It's like uh, you don't see a problem with that. Like, right. He actually took he took a left yeah. at that sign and went over there to fulfill the prophecy. It's like, bro, so, like I, that's not really what that doesn't. That's not that's not hitting like you think it is. Right. Like, I, I, you know what I mean? I, like, I agree. You, it, that's it, not the it, flex. It's a, it's the same problem, but then at the same time, at least the New Testament self declares itself to be the interpreter of the old. Right. Yeah. When when the who is the who is the authoritative interpret interpreter of the signs and times like mm. who does that and that's why you have all these self you know right. self proclaimed people who've done this over you know the last two thousand years and, well that's why you have yeah, a pope when you say that, who speaks pope, we, you know from right. the throne because right. someone's got to be able to tell us what this means even if someone two hundred years ago who was in your same position told us it meant something else well now we need a new generation to tell us what it means for us, because clearly it can't mean what we thought it meant. Well, I mean, you say there are going to be earthquakes in various and diverse places. <laughs> okay. Like, <laughs> there are earthquakes, there are earthquakes me, every day. Tell me something that, ha- <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tell me something that hasn't happened. W- wars every day and of rumors of wars. Roars yeah. and rumors there of wars. There hasn't wars been, been that like, before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Famines, pestilences. Okay, T- tell me a time since there has been an earth that there hasn't been a famine right. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. You know, right. since we've had agriculture, we've had famines. You know. And so you've got to think to the to the person that says, "Who are you, old man, to mock God or whatever?" Like your God, if your God exists, has given you the most mockable thing to believe and to profess to people. Yeah. And all yeah. three of us used to believe and profess these things, and so. Uh, in in mocking this, it's almost like, like I'm I'm mocking my former self in a way, um, mm-hmm. but like this is what a divine mind delivered. This mm-hmm. mockable rendition of prophecy, um, and so yeah, I, I don't know. Also, it, also there's a certain amount of just observing it to be what it is, which is just like okay, if you give me a prophecy. And it's supposed to be foretelling something, and it's so big and vague and general. What am I supposed to do with that? Yeah, <laughs> like I mean, it's yeah. kind of not fulfilling the role of what a prophecy is supposed to see. The whole point well, of no. prophecy is to tell me <laughs> it's almost like uh, they said about the the criminal justice system, right? The criminal justice system, they say it doesn't work. No, it does work. It's doing what it was designed to do to lock up black and brown people, right? Uh, yeah. If, yeah, if you yeah. look at what it's doing, it's not that it's not working. It's doing what it was designed to do. Well, these prophecies, it's not that they're not working. They're doing what they were designed to do, to keep generations on pins and needles ad infinitum. Yeah, but what I'm and you're right in saying that. But what I'm pointing out is that it's a it's a moving of the goalposts. Yeah, it's like it's like the dude who who lowers the rim. And then just starts dunking from the, from the whole game. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, bro, like that ain't really the flex you think it is. You know, it's like, bro, like you can't just just spout off, spout out a bunch of stuff that's just really banal and normal, and then be like, yo, this is going to be the sign. That it's like, well, that's kind of not a sign, okay? Like it's been happening before you said that. Yeah, yeah. So I I agree with you too. I yeah. agree with you, but I'm just saying, like, yeah, it's. It, it is it is tantamount to being like he did this so he would fulfill such and such prophecy and it's like 
bro, if you know you're being watched and you're doing it because you know it's like you don't get real reality television when you know the camera is on you. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like mm. if you if you're if you're going to Capernaum because you wanted to fulfill a prophecy, it's like, all right, I <laughs> guess. You know what I mean? I guess. All right. And maybe <laughs> yeah. that's why they threw in there, you know, the earthquakes and the sun, you know, turning this, you know, turning in the blood. That you got to throw something divine in there so that people don't just come along and manually fulfill it. But then when the divine yeah. things are either A, so vague or so common that they're already happening or so far-fetched that it is apocalyptic. Like you're you're just saying far-fetched things to kind of just drum up the emotional aspect of our God's going to get involved. Then even if God never gets involved, but our 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 natural trouble, our distress subsides just through the 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 tides of time the romans are no longer in rule or whatever happens whatever whatever makes our distress abate we can attribute it to god because the distress is over and when the, mm-hmm. the when the divine things never happen those portents never come true we can like you said chalk it up as poetry or metaphor or figurative or spiritual or whatever we need right. yep but I, I think they tip, they typically looked at natural disasters or calamities yeah. as being uh, of like God. And, and was it Luke thirteen when the Tower of Siloam fell and, and a bunch mm. of people perished and he was like unless you repent you will likewise <laughs> perish. Like right. uh, the idea was, you you get a sense that people in that context looked at calamities, and, you know. I guess I'm trying to say they did it, but I'm like, people kind of do that now too. Yeah. If you think about it, they kind of, yeah, they, they kind of see right. things happen and then they just, and actually he was a bit progressive because he was like, he kind of was dismissing it as being of particular importance in some sense. Hmm. Um, other than to say that, you know, destruction's coming to everyone, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but you do get a sense, but then at the same time, <laughs> it's like, he's talking about both sides of his mouth because at the same time he then uses and, or he said to use in this passage, he said to use, uh, you know, destruction and calamities to, to foretell, like, you know, yeah, this is, this is a sign that things are really, really coming to a, you know, a head here historically. I mm-hmm. think people like that idea. They, yeah. I, people like a book in on history. Right. And we, I feel like we don't look for that because we don't really think of history as having the, like that kind of it, like, it's like the two bookends, like, the book in on history at the one end is sort of reliant on the other one. And because right. we kind of dismiss the first one, right. the second one isn't, it's just, it's obviously not. I was about to make that you know? very point, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. For the, anybody who's like, what is he talking about? Gen- Genesis and Revelation. Like, mm-hmm. because we've thrown out the, the, the beginning book end, uh, mm-hmm. the idea of looking at the, the closing book end. And this just brings up, you know, another point. When I was beginning to let the cat out the bag about my deconversion, a pastor of the church that I went to, he saw that my main issues at the time was with Genesis. Mm -hmm. And he Mm -hmm. tried to sort of like, ah, well, don't let the Old Testament take away the gospel from you. And then he said this to me. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't believe the New Testament because of the Old Testament. I believe the Old Testament because of the New Testament. I believe mm. Genesis because of Jesus. If the resurrection mm. and all that didn't happen, then I wouldn't be. But like you said, no, these are two bookends. This thing goes together. The mm-hmm. beginning mm-hmm. goes, the end goes. It's the same divine, you know, people always talk about the way Revelation uh, ends. Um, mm-hmm. They try to use God being the light of the city. The garden, yeah, the garden imagery. The stuff. garden imagery, God being the light of the city. They try to use that to say, mm-hmm. see, so in Genesis 1, when there's light with no sun, well, Revelation says that there's no need for a sun because God will be the light. See, it's the, the two bookends go together. Well, we're throwing the, the, the beginning out and we're throwing <laughs> yeah, we the throw, end out. We're throwing the whole book out. We're right. Throwing, and everything in between. <laughs> and everything, and in, everything between. in between. Yes, yeah. yes exactly. It's yeah. like so you can judge you can judge the book by its covers. That is right. the front and the back. <laughs> you can take it and throw the whole thing into but the trash. But that's a fitting way to end this. Like the way the <laughs> Bible begins, right? <laughs> the way the Bible begins, we know is bullshit. 
Mm -hmm. The way the Bible ends, we Mm -hmm. know is bullshit. bullshit. Mm -hmm. So you're left with this stuff in between. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to call that? Mm -hmm. No, in the the words of the apostle, what was it, Paul? We counted all this done. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, Maybe it's just a good burger, but with shitty buns. Mm. You know, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's what's going on here. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, but Jesus is coming back to the future. <laughs> so, hey, this was a great episode, guys. I appreciate your time. In the comments, what do, we, what, do we, what do we want them doing in the comments? Uh, are you on pins and needles? Are you expecting Jesus' return? Um, it's yeah, imminent. You should, you should ask them if we, you should ask them if we left them behind with, were they left behind with all of our uh, um, uh, apologetics lingo? Because we, we noticed, uh, hmm. uh, you know, go ahead. Brady. Well, I tried to be good about asking us to break down the, the terms we were using. So hopefully we didn't leave them behind too far. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But are you a preterist? Did Jesus return already? Um, are you a partial preterist? Are you, uh, are you, do you believe in the rapture? Are you, uh, yeah. Uh, if you're not a believer, you know, uh, do you have any bookends? How do you think this, where do you think this thing is going? What are you looking forward to? <laughs> um, yeah, so, but no, appreciate you guys' time. We'll wrap it up there. Uh, we'll be back with a new one.